Hello, and welcome to an Age of Sail Primer. Now, what is an Age of Sail Primer? Well, it's I'm grouping it under long patrols and all those sorts of things on here because technically an Age of Sail Primer is what normally a lecturer will give their class before they start talking about the Age of Sail. Mainly because... <laughs> <laughs> oh, things get very interesting very quickly. Because Hollywood has Hollywoodized the Age of Sail quite so much. I mean, it's a bit of a pet peeve for several of us, and I know Kate Jameson does amazing work on Twitter and various other forums to try and correct some of the misconceptions as well as to other many great Age of Sail historians, um, Alan James of Kings. Uh, Samuel McLean, who's... Sorry, Sam, I was actually spent the last couple of, uh, couple of seconds there thinking about your surname. I do apologise. Who is part of Global Maritime History with me? They do amazing work. There are others beyond that who are doing amazing work to try and correct some of the perceptions about the Age of Sail you have. A primer is usually what we use beforehand, before going through, because when you're giving your lectures, you need to have answered some questions and established a certain basis of knowledge. Before I get into that, I am going to do my quick advertising gig, mainly because, as you all know, if I get, hopefully, well, no, or maybe if this is your first time watching, you won't, my aunt and I have a tradition of, well, my whole family has a tradition of family bragging rights bets. And the first one of these was over uh, when the whole thing started, that I would never get to a certain, I think it was 2,000 subscribers, I can never, I, I can't remember. And uh, sort of all that sort of thing. And I did. Anyway, this time, when I showed her these from the spreadsheet, these are four designs on sale. And there's supposed to be a U HMS Unicorn one coming soon as well. And there's a couple more behind that that will be hopefully coming at some point. She said that if I got to 13,000 subscribers by December the 31st, 2021, she and my uncle would be pictured wearing Blackburn, Blackburn face masks. And okay, if this was a if it was a case of I was already at eight, nine thousand subscribers, I probably wouldn't be pushing this as much as I am doing. But I'm having to push this quite hard because I'm at less than six and a half thousand subscribers. So I need to double to have a chance of winning. I don't think I have much of a chance, but you know, we'll try that. Right. So, Age of Sail primers. First things first. What's a decent game to try and get an idea of the Age of Sail that most people can play? There you go. This is Total War Emp Empire. And it's about as good as you're going to get. I have to admit, some of the fleet control dynamics are very, very annoying. You cannot set sub-commanders, and there are issues, like in this battle, I won, but it was a weird win in that at one point three of my ships had technically surrendered, and I am to this day, when I watched the video about the playback, because I saved it, because I wasn't sure what happened, and also ships, I have no idea why they tried to surrender. I ended up having to recapture them. That's fine. I don't mind. But their third rates they don't tend to they're not really supposed to give in that easily. But the reason I did it was I actually put this up on a big screen and did the battle, played the battle, talked it through with my students. I was once as part of a primer. And the reason that was I was using this as an illustrative fleet in that 
There is a Raze frigate here because I had to have one frigate at least. And frankly, I found I preferred the Raze, despite the fact it would probably have been a fifth rate or a brig or a couple of brigs would have been their normal sort of frigating uh, frigate force for this size fleet. You know, will notice that I actually have two first rate admiral's ships here. Again, that's me cheating slightly. A second rate, and the rest of the ship's line are all third rates. This is not an unusual formation. This is the sort of size squadron you might well find sailing the what? It's ten for it's ten ships line. It's a frigate. Um, they're lovely. It's, it's fairly viable, and it's going up against the force of, if I remember correctly. Uh, about roughly equal. I think the French I set up with, they didn't get a Raze. They had regular frigates. So they have two frigates. So they have one more ship, but their frigates are not as good as my Raze. And I spent most of the battle, I have to admit, with them. The ship, the, uh, giving the squadrons, which I grouped my ships align into two five ship squadrons. Giving them sailing orders, sending them around, them blasting away, and me going around the map with the Raze, basically doing ship on ship engagements. Which might explain how free ended up being surrendering. Anyway, the point of that rambling discussion is that this is still one of the best games available for having age of sail combat for the options. Because it is more complicated than you just pounding away with a solid shot. You can go with chain. You can go with grape shot. If you are doing long range in uh, long range running engagement, you should be firing chain shot. You should be taking out the enemy's ability to maneuver. Because just like you'd like to hit an opponent in their propeller, hitting and taking out a mast, taking out sails, stops their maneuverability, cuts them down. Then, as you close in, you change to solid shot. You pound holes in them. You turn them into splinters. And then once you get really close, that's when you change to grape shot. You wipe out their decks. You're bored. You take the ship. It's a very, very similar mechanic. It's not the best. It's not perfect. But it's within people's reach financially. And it's something that we can all sort of work out how to play and play along with and enjoy. So there you go, there's your first part of a primer, where to go and get some of your own experience. Now we're as close as we can get to it today because unfortunately no one's going to allow me to build a fleet of ships of the line and get some poor unsuspecting French or Spanish person to build an, their own fleet of the ships of the line and then uh, see if we can't fight a bat, refight Trafalgar. Next primer. When you see tons by a Age of Sail ship, if in doubt, it's tons burfen. Now, tons burfen means an estimation of their cargo carrying capacity by volume, not their displacement, so the things do not uh, go across. You can tell this by the fact that K, the length in feet from the stern to the st stem to the stern post, times b the maximum breadth of vessel, vessel times half b again divided by 94 that's not a formula for working out the displacement of a ship it's not even that great a, for, a formula for working out the capacity of the ship It's what existed at the time. So, these are the normal diagrams you see for Age of Sail. Starters, if you see this listed in front of you as your likely definition of the ship designs, it's not really a good one. It sometimes comes around in English, but the original version, and I have to say the original version I can find, is not English. 
In fact, I think that is Spanish, but I could be wrong. Doesn't look French though. But that's the oldest version of that around, and it does fit more with Spanish style ships than French or British, which tend to have more of what I would call an Atlantic fit. You also have this lovely drawing, but whenever I show this drawing to people and go, well, there's a first rate and a third rate in it, it gives you the ideas of them, it's not really that much help because that's actually quite an advanced drawing in the first place. It's good for me if I want to talk quickly about something because I can point and discuss and I can go through it and go, look, you, know, you can see the mast positions, how deep they go, you can see the outline in the hull, what's going on there, etc. I can talk about all that, but the details and information don't aren't really enough there. It's more of a go look this up yourself, which quite a lot of people do when they see this drawing, they tend to go and look at it up, than a help. This, though, is a help. And this one is one we're going to talk through. Because first important thing you've got to learn about Age of Sail as a in a primer is what a spinnaker is. A spinnaker, well, that's a very specific type of sail. And if you've probably already spotted, there is a spanker. <laughs> now, I have to admit that whenever I am going through this one, I have it zoomed in really high on another screen not far away from me because it is very, very de detailed. So, there is a spanker. That is the sternmost sail. You can see that quite clearly. That is, how do I put this? The one which hangs out with a boom over the stern. Now, the masts are called the foremast, the main mast, and the mizzen mast. The mizzen mast is the one at the stern, which the spanker is, and thanks to its spanker boom, is dangling off. Now, the sails on your, ma on your mast. Well, the top third of the highest sail is called a royal. So if it's on the mizzen, it's the mizzen royal. If it's the main, it's called the main royal. If it's called the four is the foremast, it's the four royal royal. And also at that point, the mast is called the main royal mast because you might think of the mast as one contiguous piece of wood. It isn't, and it isn't treated as such. Now, it needs to be made up of very long, long pieces of wood, and they would like it to be as contiguous as possible, but it's often not. So you actually have the main mast at that point. is called the main royal mast. The ones below the royals are called the top gallants, because for a long time, they were as high as they could get. Once they got better at the technology and they could add a level above it, that's when you get the royals. So, main top gallant, Four top gallant, mizzen top gallant. Next sail down, well, that's called the top sail. Main top sail, mizzen top sail, and four top sail again. And finally, the lowest sails you've got are the main sail, are the four sail. And you'll notice there is no massive sail on the mizzen mast. Why would that be? because it would be straight over norm uh, where the conning position normally is and would cause all sorts of issues, which is why they have a spanker. With the spanker boom and the uh, spanker brails and all the various other things they have for it. The rigging, the sheets, all these things have individual names. So. It's quite interesting sometimes when you're watching a movie and you're hearing them saying, splice this and do that. Well, they have actual things. Splice the main brace. Well, there is actually a main brace. There is an actual... It, it's also... Uh, it is actually a phrase used but uh, for doing other things, but there is a main brace. There are also backstays all sorts of different points 
which are there for the mouse to hold up. Now, forward, you will notice there are some more sails. There is, right, and I always love saying this, you have the four top mast stay sail, which is the lowest one. Then you have the four, uh, the um, jib, and the four top mast uh, so main sail, uh, top mast stay sail, will connect to the bowsprit level of the line going out, of the forward, well, the bowsprit, the boom forward. And then you have the jib, which will be connected to the jib boom. And then there's the flying jib, which is the bit beyond it. And guess what? The flying jib boom as well is what holds that up, is what that's connected to. And yes, not all of these, these sails do develop over time. So some of the earlier ships do not have these sails. But... By the time you get later and later, more and more sails appear. And also, many of the sails which appear and have names we consider them to be normal and regular sails in later periods were also around sort of in earlier periods with different officers and people trying their own way. But it is fun. Right, next thing. Ships of the line, or great frigates. All these lovely things. This is a rating system, and this is a, from the Royal Navy's rating system, of course, because, well, normally I use the Royal Navy as the starting point because I'm teaching usually in British universities, and therefore the most information available in the library and various other places that are easily accessible to my, other than my students is going to be stuff about the Royal Navy. First thing people tend to notice, though, about this is none of these figures. It's these ones over here. Because normally, by the time they get to them, they've already heard me talking about the high-low mix of fleets and how it's the normal way of war. In Napoleonic era, you have, in 1794, you have five first rates in the Royal Navy. You have nine second rates. Hmm. You have 71 third rates. You have eight fourth rates. You have 78 fifth rates. You have 22 of the larger sixth rates and 10 of the smaller sixth rates. And then you have 76 sloops of war. And then probably, <laughs> I, I wouldn't be surprised if you have a good hundred or so gun brigs, brigs, and schooners, and cutters and schooners, possibly more. Once you include cutters and schooners, it could well be into a couple of hundred. They're just small ships, and they can have crews of tiny crews. And the thing is, they can be ships taken up from trade, captured, all sorts of things going around at any one point. They just put a naval crew on board. So you sometimes the Royal Navy doesn't realize how many to have. By 1814, war's been going on for another 20 years by this point. The Royal Navy has massively, this is in the height of war, have gone up to seven first rates. From five. They've gone down from nine to eight second rates. So this is another point. When I start talking about Admiral Calder, and we talk about the effect of him, and there are a fair number of people going, he's just taking one ship away, why does it matter? When you consider the second rates are that few in number in the Royal Navy, 
taking a second rate away on the eve of a battle before like Trafalgar ends up being is a massive, massive thing. He might have had a legitimate reason. It might have been nice and Nelson let him go of it and all these things. But it's still a big thing. And it's the, by the point of Calder, and I, I said this during the, the video, it's the politics of it. It's the imagery of it. And that's why there's so much imagery. There are now 103 third rates in service. The Royal Navy has gone up by 32 third rates. They've gone up by two fourth rates. They have gone up by 56 fifth rates. They're at 134. The upper sixth rate has disappeared completely. There's 25 of the lower sixth rate now. And there are theoretically 360 vessels in the sloop of war category. Which I'm fairly certain includes some of the larger gun brigs and brigs have been added into that one. So, yes, the Royal Navy has a huge range of ships. But the vast majority are fit in three categories. The overwhelming majority fit in three categories. The mass of the Royal Navy comes from three categories. Now, first rate are the largest ships, of course. And they would tend to have at least 100 guns. They were, by this point, this earlier in, in the Jacobean period, it's 80 guns across three gun decks. It's usually at least three gun decks they have. And it's the same with second rates. They will have three gun decks. Honestly, trying to tell a first rate and a second rate apart is very difficult. Because they'll at least have three gun decks, they'll look equally unwieldy and unmaneuverable. It's only when you start counting the number of piercings. And remember, these guns are the number of guns they're pierced for. In wartime, the commander might well fit them as many as he can. He might add carronades on, he might add all sorts of things. But they also might have guns stowed away for various reasons. They might make them faster. It might, they might have chucked them overboard to make themselves faster in a race. It might make them more stable in the sea. It might be that they're attracting as a troop ship, so their guns are all stowed down to give space in the gun decks for people to stay. Again, this is another reason why it becomes very difficult for enemies to be able to tell apart large East Indiamen from, uh, from Navy ships, because the Navy ships sometimes don't look like Navy ships in terms of their number of guns firing. Once you get onto the third rate, then you have a slightly different thing going on. They are usually the longest of the two gun deck ships. They are originally described as middling ships, and middling ships really fits them. They are the heavy two deckers. They are the backbone of any fleet, the vast majority of that fleet. Now, the thing you always have to remember is that in the Royal Navy, any ship which is 64 to 80 guns is a third rate. And usually this goes around the 74 gun system. But the French at various points have, uh, how do I put this politely, their own rating system going on. 
At various times, the French have their own ideas completely. So, sometimes when you start applying a British rating system to other navies, and you say something is a third rate, it's not a third rate. Because it's not in that navy, it's a different rating. So you have to be careful when you're going back and forwards. But, as a rule, again, usually in terms of short form, we do allow, most academics do allow the aggregate of using the British rating as system as standard, because that's where most of the rating comes from. And again, in British universities, I can't speak for another university, I haven't really, a little bit, but not much experience of those. Now, the interesting one, of course, is the fourth rate, which is this sort of, what happened to you? They are the smallest two-deck ships. I can honestly say that I think the reason that they go up in number is those are East Indiamen, which are turned into four freights. And... Or Razaid frigates. Razaid other vessels to create four freights. Um, they were useful. But they were useful on foreign stations where you need something heavier than a fifth rate but you didn't want to go to the cost of sending a third rate out. But for most of the time, they just send a third rate. They would keep a lot of them and they would send them out and they would use them. But usually when you find the fourth rates, if you are taught reading about a battle and it says a fourth rates involved, then there are two stations you should be considering you could be talking about. The Caribbean, Or the East Indies. If it ain't one of those, then something's interesting's happened. And I do say this knowing all about HMS Africa, because let's be honest, she just turns up to anything and it's a party because she's there. But she's not really supposed to be. She's been sent, she's coming down because they are scraping the barrel and because they, she's available and they're sending her. Not because she's really the ship they want to go touring around fighting in, in, in European waters. And I say this as someone who has even sung the song about HMS Africa. So, you know. But she is, as said, a 64 gun. She is therefore technically a third rate, but Yeah. Technically a third rate, but really by that point, all the practical purposes are fourth rate in how the British government and the Royal Navy were treating them. So this is what happens. By the time of Trafalgar, 1805 to 1814 period, if third rates functionally, the ones being built are mostly in the 74 or higher gun category. Because it makes sense. Because they need the firepower. And because they can be. So, usually it becomes quite easy when you're dealing with ships line, if you're looking at pictures of them. If you see three decks, you know it's a first or second, uh, a first or second rate. If you see it's two decks, it's more than likely a fourth or third rate. But overwhelmingly, probably a third rate. And occasionally there are a few fifth rates, which I wander into the two decks, but it's, it's kind of rare. And again, when you're on one deck, you're on a frigate. So if it's got more than one deck, the odds are it's not a frigate. They are rare. There are some, but they are rare. Because again, if something's built fr is frigate built, it's tend to be built uh, uh, built longer and slightly slimmer. Um, as I've been over, and I think Drax's been over, and various authors have been over, 
the Royal Navy tends to prefer slightly shorter, slightly fatter ships of the line because that's found to be more maneuverable when you get into a battle. And whilst the longer, thinner one can race across the ocean better, what matters is when you what you can do when you get there. So yeah, you might get there half a day, even a day later than your opponent. But the odds are they ain't going to be able to do much in a day. And often it's not that much of an advantage because, again, copper bottering and various other things the British do eat, it eats that down. Eats that advantage down massively. But in terms of frigates, well, the Royal Navy tends to want those to be fast. There was an interesting thing I had to say. I was I was reading the British, uh, the Greenwich Maritime Museum's um, various descriptions, and it called them the glamour ships. Your frigate captains can get a lot of glamour. Yes, they can get a lot of prizes. They can make a lot of money. But also, those are the ships taking the big risks. Those are the ships which are very, very interesting in terms of their experiences of going long-range operations from the UK. And those are the ships which are in constant demand. So yes, they get the glamour, but they also get a lot of stress. And very few captains are massively famous in getting the massive amount of prizes. The vast majority, as you can see, there is a lot more than just five or six. They're just doing their patrolling, scouting for the fleets, and doing the best they can. Okay, other questions I normally have to answer. Firstly, when you see a cannon listed as a 32 pounder or 64 pounder, they're talking about the weight of shot. Now, I know vast majority of you watching this video, that is probably not a surprise. You're just going, Alex, why are you saying this? I have had that question more times than I would frankly like to remember. So I'm putting in here. When we talk about a 32 pounder cannon, we're talking about the weight of the cannonball going into it. Okay. And remember it's 2.2 .2 pounds equals a roughly a kilogram. So in total terms of 11 pounds is five kilograms. So that is very close to, but not quite, it's about a pound short of 15 kilograms in terms of that weight of shot. So, I don't know, 14 and a half kilograms. If you have those big, those half a kilogram bags of sugar, you need probably to buy 29 of them to equal the weight of that cannibal. But really, I'm not sure why you're buying sugar bags that small. These would be loaded. They are all muzzle loading. All muzzle loading. And as you can see, they have a rammer. They ram everything down. They have a wad to try and create a seal. The reason they're using the wad to create the seal is because the shot doesn't fit the cannon perfectly. We're not talking an age of precision machinery and rifling. We're talking an age of the fact that they're doing as accurate as they are doing is frankly frigging amazing and they're working really hard to do it and to try and get there, but it's not quite there. You'll notice that there is a bit of wadding before it, there's a bit of wadding after it, and then there is the powder and the picker so they can set their things up or they can set the powder off. Now you can go off half cock, you can shoot your wad. All sorts of things. There are phrases that we have today, thanks to the loading of cannon. And thanks to the things that we go on. And believe it or not, 
many, many ships carried a lot of spare rammers because the rammer would go flying sometimes or get forgotten or left in there in a hurry to roll it out and would go flying at the enemy ship. I'm not sure if the rammer ever did more than just turn into splinters, but it's cool to think about. And again, 32 pounds is the weight of shot, not the weight of the cannon. Can weigh a lot more than 32 pounds. Here's a lovely design of the freight frigate. Ah, uh, the biggest thing I have to deal with. And I'm told this usually by students who've gone off and read a couple of interesting books I'm not going to name, and they come back and they go, ah, yes, but the French designed their ships more scientifically than the British or the Spanish, and they applied mathematical principles, and they have very detailed plans. Guess what? The Spanish, the British, everyone has very detailed plans. The Dutch, everyone has detailed plans. Many of those plans are still in existence to this day, and you can go and look at them. Go to the Woolwich Arsenal in Greenwich, go to Portsmouth, go to the Royal Mu uh, the uh, Royal Observatory Museum at Greenwich, all sorts of places, you will find these drawings. The French make a big thing about using mathematical principles to it. The British tend to make a big thing about the French doing it because the French, that allows them to justify building, we go back to it, this lovely fleet. <laughs> because, again, it's kind of like the production, the maritime infrastructure production of Germany in World War One and World War Two. The British have more, or rather, the British are able to utilize their production far more effectively than the French. For starters, they don't have their production split opposite ends of the country in terms of one's on in the Mediterranean and one's in the Atlantic, and they have to go around Spain to get between two. They're all on, roughly, they can float around to each other. They can, their roads are contiguous. And the fact is the Royal Navy tends to get quite a lot of decent funding and quite a lot of decent admin work. Again, Royal Navy, this is, the, pro, the constant problem the French always have is the number of ministers of marines they have and the different ideas they have, and they seem to be constantly going through it. At one point, there's a guy called Colbert who's frankly... He, he's got some good ideas, but actual implementation of them seems to be beyond them. And it's the same. The Royal Navy, they have less exciting, but they plod along. But if you want to see how much work they put into, draw, into draw, designing these ships... Go to Chatham. Go to Chatham Dockyard, and you will see huge spaces which are laid out for drawing and designing ships by hand. They hand very skilled architects and draftsmen, and they were very, very cautious with what they built. In terms of they designed it first before they started cutting the wood. The Royal Dockyards are, if you consider the lines of St. Vincent, hotbeds of sin and the uh, sin, depravity, and work shyness. The reality was they were never funded enough to really do all they needed to do. The Royal Navy, uh, they were funded better than their equivalents, but they were never funded enough. And that's why you get admirals getting the fond belief that, you know, they're not getting the supplies they want because of X, Y, and Z. There is a bit of that, but the vast majority of it is you have to supply multiple fleets, you have to keep them all going, and they all require the, they all require the same stuff right this minute. Because every admiral is sure that if their fleet, their fleet... And only their fleet doesn't have every bit of supplies they need right the second, then they, you're putting at risk the fate of the entire nation. Again, 
Royal Navy Admirals. Healthy egos. Most admirals, healthy egos. You find me a mild, unassuming admiral. I'll be very, very confused as to how that person made an admiral. Right, so, I hope you enjoyed the primer. The reason I'm putting this up in August is because it goes September. October, and then we have Trafalgar and Taranto month, or TT month. Expect there to be a primer on naval aviation put up at some point, but um, there again, I might be doing enough videos about that to make sure that gets home. I love Trafalgar and Taranto. Um, I have done dinners, I have been the guest speaker on both those topics. And they are fun things to go and talk about. But they also tend to produce a lot of very, very strange history. Watch out for it. Like with everything you see in life, please take this advice. Read it through twice. And then check its sources. Trust, but verify. And when I say check its sources, I mean check its sources. Check them out. Check what quality they are. I will never forget a student who came into my class absolutely ecstatic because they'd found somewhere a thing which proved their entire theory. And it was. A reputable site. It was on a reputable news organization. So I went, this must be trustworthy. I went, okay. They're quoting everything from this one academic. Check up who that academic is. It was on an area of engineering. They were engineering students. The academic was not an engineer by any stretch of the imagination. Okay, that doesn't necessarily mean they're badly informed or producing a bad, uh, bad source or bad work. It could, they could be like me. They could be a history, a history, a historian of engineering. In which case, in the nicest way, there are times when my engineering knowledge does disturb even me. They weren't, and the university they have theoretically had their PhD from. And they were calling themselves an independent academic, always a slightly worrying phrase, although I am one myself. But that's mainly because I'm a contract lecturer, so no one wants to take permanent ownership of me. No one wants to give me tenure at the moment. It's terrible. I'm applying for the jobs, but no. Anyway. Okay, independent academic. The PhD was from one of the room uh, of one of the PhD mills in America. There are a few interesting universities in America, which your PhD is less about what you're writing and doing research for and how much money you can hand over. Although there are a few other universities in the world which aren't too dissimilar. Anyway, cut a long story short, ended up with me sending an email through to the um, particular publication and going, are you quite sure where you've got this information from? Well, yes, we have sent this official looking report via the, a digital report. Have you checked it? And the article got taken down. Trust, but verify. It's not being cynical making sure you get as full a picture as possible because the other really cool thing other occasions where this has happened and I've been surprised but upon and it has turned out to be fully correct and it's turned out to be fully correct more often than it's turned out not to be it's been really interesting being able to read the full report the full article the full journal article and if you can't get access to it find a friend who does have access to JSTOR or something like that and they might all be able to get access to the journal article that originally starts it all for you. 
and that can give you open up a whole world of information. Anyway, thank you. And as said at the beginning, please, if I get to thirteen thousand subscribers, which is double, a little bit over double of what I have right currently, my aunt I get bragging rights, and my aunt and uncle pictured wearing Blackburn Blackburn face masks. I'm currently on here. I'm fairly sure my mum is really, really rooting for this. You might end up with her jumping into a live going, please subscribe. She wants her twin sister to have to do that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Take care. And when I say links to everything, Discord, links to... Spreadshirt, links to joining the channels and joining Patreon are all down below. Thank you very much. Take care.